For most of the last decade, I've been a reporter covering stories about how technology is reshaping public life, from debates about God to protests in the streets. One thing I've noticed is that internet culture has an odd way of using a really important word, democracy. When a new app is said to be democratizing something, whether it's uh, robotic personal assistants or sepia-toned selfies, it means something like making more people able to access that thing. Just access. Gone are those old associations of town meetings and voting booths. Gone are co-ownership, co-governance, accountability. Words are the tools of my trade as a writer, so I like to have a handle on what they mean. Words matter so much. They connect us with each other, and they remind us what we're capable of. I hope that the internet can help make our definitions of democracy more ambitious, rather than redefining it out of existence. In late 2014, I was working on a story about Amazon's Mechanical Turk, a platform where users can find entirely online piecework, jobs that might take between seconds and hours, uh, say, transcribe a receipt, or fill out a sociological survey, or provide feedback on an ad. I went to a conference in New York that included some real live Mechanical Turkers. One was a wife whose husband had lost his job, another a former cable technician. There I heard them describe what working on the platform is like. Employers can review them, they can't review employers. Their work can be rejected without remuneration or recourse. There are no constraints to prevent below minimum wage pay. One of them actually complained about this in the media and found that her account had been frozen. Over the course of those days, a kind of question came up among the Turkers, a, a thought experiment. They wondered aloud, what if we own the platform? How would we set the rules? They'd sit with that for a few minutes, batting ideas back and forth about how to make it better for themselves and better for Amazon. They were reasonable ideas and clever ones. But soon the ideas would fade back into reality and back to the complaints. Since then, the agonies over this dictionary editing internet have only intensified. People have blockaded Google buses in San Francisco to protest wealth inequality, and Uber drivers have gone on strike around the world. Increasingly, this online economy is becoming the economy, the way that more and more of us find jobs, relationships, and a roof over our heads. The internet companies aspire to network and monetize everything from our cars to our refrigerators. The companies call this the Internet of Things. The Turkers' questions keep coming back to me. Were they on to something? What if the networks and platforms really were ours? What if we had instead an Internet of Ownership? Now, another word that the internet has gotten to is sharing. Sharing used to be something that we do among people that we know and trust. In the so-called sharing economy, it means more convenient transactions that take place on distant servers somewhere. Convenience is great, but all along, there's been a real sharing economy at work, the cooperative economy. One can date the modern cooperative movement to the Rochdale Principles of 1844 in Britain though uh, its antecedents go back much further to ancient tribes, monasteries, and villages around the world. The rudiments of this stuff could be basic common sense. Shared ownership and governance among the people who depend on an enterprise. Shared profits. Cooperation among enterprises rather than competition. Now that's real sharing and real democracy. Co-ops are all around us if we bother to look. In Colorado, where I live, 70% of the state's territory gets its power from cooperative electric companies that date back to the 1930s and earlier, owned and governed by the people they serve. The credit union, where I'm a member, is one of the largest mortgage lenders in the region. Up in the mountains west of me, a few years back, a bunch of neighbors got together and created their own co-op internet service provider. 
There's also Lando Lakes, Organic Valley, and REI. Co-ops come in all shapes and sizes. They fail less than other businesses, and they often pay better, except maybe to top executives. Democracy, it turns out, works, though it can be less lucrative for those who are just trying to get rich. People in charge are harder to swindle. I, I lived in a co-op house once, and it followed a certain dirty, organic, folk music, every night stereotype, right? But the same couldn't be said for what I saw at Kenya's business school for managers of co-ops. Their co-ops hold about half the GDP, and these students look like business students anywhere, except that along with all the marketing and case studies, they were learning how to run a business where the people who work for you are your bosses. In the area around Barcelona, among the Catalan Integral Cooperative's thousands of members, I saw a glimpse of what co-ops of the future might look like more and more. Rather than trying to secure old-fashioned jobs, these independent workers help each other become more able to rely on the housing, food, childcare, and computer code they hold in common. They trade with their own digital currency. Part of this legacy, after all, has already played out in tech culture. The internet relies on free, open source tools built through feats of peer-to-peer -peer self governance. Things like Wikipedia and Linux visit many tech offices from a startup's garage to the Googleplex, and you see self-organizing teams building projects from the bottom up. Yet this democracy often doesn't make it to the boardroom. Things are still pretty 20th century corporate in there, with whoever happens to hold the most shares calling the shots. It's like there's a firewall. We seem to be able to practice democracy everywhere, except where it really matters. There are some pretty sci-fi questions before us these days. Will apps and robots replace our jobs? Will any aspect of our digital lives escape the notice of surveillance? Can there be a digital utopia without the dystopias of sweatshops and blood minerals? In each case, the cooperative tradition poses questions which, in the onrush of change, we may neglect to ask. Who owns the tools that we live by? How are they governed? Now, about a year after the conference with the Mechanical Turkers in late 2015, I was back in New York. I teamed up with Trevor Schultz, the new school professor who organized the earlier event. We put together a gathering called Platform Cooperativism, a marriage of online platforms and cooperative enterprise. We couldn't believe what we stumbled into. It was an idea whose time has come. More than 1,000 people came, including uh, CEOs, investors, New York City Council members, and star scholars. One of the Turkers came, too. An article in the Washington Post referred to the event as a huge success. Among us were platform builders from around the world, people who didn't seem to get Silicon Valley's memo that the sharing economy was supposed to keep that sharing only skin deep. They'd been building businesses that practiced shared ownership and governance all the way down. There was Stocksy United, a stock photo website owned by photographers. Fairmundo, a German Amazon-like platform uh, owned by its vendors. Robinhood, a robotic cooperative hedge fund and Loconomics, a gig platform where the workers are in charge. The internet of shared ownership seemed to be taking shape around us. A uh, digital democracy, a, a true commons. But there were also common challenges. Financing, for instance, is difficult because many investors who know about tech don't know about how to work with co-ops and vice versa. The same goes for getting good legal advice. But now, these entrepreneurs, rather than hacking in isolation, they knew each other. They were turning cooperation into a competitive advantage. Now, what about the big platforms that weren't there? When you think about it, the Googles, Facebooks, and Ubers aren't just regular companies anymore. Their business models depend on how much we depend on them. And their ubiquity, in turn, is what makes them so useful. They're becoming public utilities. 
And the less we have a choice about whether or not to use them, the more I think we need democracy to step in. What if a new generation of antitrust law, rather than breaking up these emerging online monopolies, instead created a pathway for more democratic ownership? Rather than donating Facebook shares to his own LLC, Mark Zuckerberg could put them into a trust owned and governed by Facebook users themselves. Then maybe they could have a seat in the boardroom when decisions are being made about what to do with all that personal, valuable data they pour into the platform. How would you vote? These aren't just questions about what kind of internet we want or even what kind of world we want. They're also about how we see ourselves. Do we trust ourselves enough to expect democracy from the institutions on which we rely? Are we bold enough to imagine, as the mechanical Turkers were, what the internet would look like if we were in charge? 30 years ago, while the internet wasn't much more than a lab experiment, the social critic Theodore Rozak saw a lot of this coming. Making the democratic most of the information age, he wrote, is a matter not only of technology, but of the social organization of that technology. We forget that. New gizmos come and go so quickly that we hardly notice when the definitions of our words have changed and when what we expect of ourselves changes with them. Ordinary people have already made the internet their own with their hacks, their memes, their protests, and their dreams. The cost of forfeiting control over these things is too high and too mysterious. We need to expect better and demand more. It's time that we owned and governed what is ours already. Thank you.